the uh, last official day of the conference. I was there. Uh, once again, I, I can't thank Good. everyone enough. Uh, the Oakland staff, uh, again, has been amazing. Um, they've done a wonderful job, presented a, a great venue for us, and we owe them a lot of, a lot of gratitude, so we greatly appreciate that. I also want to take this time to thank uh, Audrey Blake, uh, Dennis Blake, Lauren Mamey, Michelle McShane, for all the help that uh, they've given me um, putting the conference on together. It's been a, it's been a big task, it's been a, a big job, uh, but obviously we could not have done it without Jeanette Milligan and the Arkansas HBPA, uh, Patrice, obviously Judge Wamsley and his entire board, um, but uh, because of their generosity and their ability to work with us and help us negotiate uh, uh, the waters between here and, and Oak Lawn on the, on the front side, uh, we've had an amazing conference. So um, it's been well received. Uh, we have a lot of positive comments. Uh, so I want to thank, thank everyone. Uh, I also want to have a, a generous thank you shout out to all of our conference sponsors, uh, mostly affiliates uh, who dip into their pockets, not only to pay registration, uh, but also to, to help us with the funding to put on such a great event. Uh, so we, we, we greatly appreciate each one of you guys who've given us uh, monetary sponsorship. Um, obviously our corporate sponsors are with us all year long, uh, but all the conference uh, sponsors that come on, and, and again, thanks to Michelle for getting that, getting that done for us. Uh, definitely also want to thank this morning's breakfast sponsors. We have the Iowa HBPA along with the Iowa Thoroughbred Breeders and Owners Association who helped uh, once again put on a great breakfast. Uh, one last thing, we have found a pair of sunglasses. Uh, we have also found a, a mouse, a uh, computer mouse at one of the tables here in the back. We have those. Um, don't run over there because I can tell you right now these sunglasses aren't expensive, um, but they are lost pair of sunglasses. So, so we're going to get started with uh, something that's um, extremely passionate for me. Uh, the benefit providers panel this morning is going to be focused uh, uh, very much on something that myself, with, with Will Vile in particular, um, really put a lot of work into on the federal level. Uh, so I want to first introduce uh, someone who needs no introduction, uh, Richard Rydell, who's the co-committee chair with the benefit providers to get our panel started off. So thank you very much. Thank you, Eric. Good morning, everyone. Good to see you. Before we get started with today's program, I want to remind you about the pink evaluation sheets that are at each table. Please leave, read the subject carefully so that you can uh, comment on the correct session. Yesterday, Peter Ecker provided a valuable presentation regarding internal controls for nonprofits, and I asked him to summarize that half hour of information into a checklist. So my instant expert provided one this morning. So if you would like a copy of this, it's easy to follow, good information. Please note it on your print pink evaluation sheet. Put your name and your email address and I'll get a copy out to you next week. And welcome to the benefits providers panel presentation of guest worker programs and employer development. Your moderator this morning is Remy Bell. Since October 2011, Remy has served as the Executive Director of Equine Studies at Bluegrass Community and Technical College, which since 2006 remains North America's most successful accredited vocational racing school and has become a key workforce provider for the horse racing industry. Please welcome Remy. Just so you know exactly who I am. 
Jim and Eric uh, for the invitation. Uh, it's great to see a lot of uh, old friends from years ago. Uh, I was here at the National HBPA, and um, uh, you know. And so, let me start off first of all by introducing uh, our, our, our incredible panel. Um, from uh, the left here, you all know him very well, Dr. Reed McFarlane, who's going to be talking. Uh, employer education and how we navigate this incredible issue. Oscar Gonzalez is, uh, you know, uh, I think a co-chair of the California Horse Racing Board and a, a member of the President Biden's team at the USDA uh, and uh, uh, is very, very much tied into the whole process of guest worker, visa, access, and things like that. You all know Will Belly, Horseman Labor Solutions. Um, what Will is going to uh, bring us up to speed on a lot of the current issues on uh, accessing guest worker visas. And Julio Rubio, who's with the Kentucky HBPA. You can see all those titles uh, up on the screen, by the way. And, and Julio is going to tell us a little bit about uh, what, what he sees as some of the challenges that we face with the workforce uh, on a day to day basis. But before we start, I want to get a, a quick show of hands. We've talked about a lot of issues this past week. We talked about fixed stops, wagering, simulcasting, things like that. Uh, as owners and trainers and owner trainers out there, uh, I want to get a show of hands. In this past week, uh, have you had to deal with workforce issues back in the barn, groups showing up on time, uh, walkers and all that, more than five times through this past week? Raise your hands if that's been the case. Of, getting the help to the bar and everything else. No, you guys do a great job. Okay, you can get a couple of folks back there. All right, this I feel, um, since I was here at the HBPA and National HBPA now in the, on the academic side, this I feel is uh, an issue that is as important to our industry as uh, medication reform, as uh, finding homes for retired resources, uh, it could become, over the next couple of years, an existential problem for our industry. Because what does it matter if you want to expand your operation, buy more horses, build a new extension to your farm or your barn, if you don't have the workers that are there to muck out the stalls, to take care of the horses and all that. So what we're going to talk about today uh, is, um, uh, first of all, we're going to uh, Here. And if we can uh, move uh, that so we move to the next slide. Or, okay. A couple of key questions that we're going to address today. We're going to talk a little bit about the, the balance we need to strike in our, our efforts at you know, developing and, and improving our work, access to a workforce. Uh, the balance between Access to guest worker visas, which is critically important to our industry through the H2A and H2B visa programs, versus the training of domestic workers, of building a pipeline, a national pipeline, of bringing on young workers into our industry, training, giving them the skills they need to succeed. Um, the importance of recruitment, training, but more than anything else, we train them. Because in many cases, we have valued employees but how do we keep them? How do we keep them from running on the street to go work at Amazon? Uh, is, it, is it about pay? Is it about housing? Is it about work-life balance or a combination of those three things? So how do we keep the employees we have? It's a lot easier to keep somebody than to retrain, retrain a new worker, as I'm sure we can all agree. Um, employer education, uh, you know, in many cases, Will and Julio and, and we will be working with employers, with trainers, with owners and all that. And in many cases, they may not be aware of the programs that are out there like BCTC, Equine, like a, what we do in Lexington or, or other programs. They may not be aware about uh, what's out there about uh, training pipelines and things like that. Or may not be aware of uh, access to uh, obtaining guest worker visas. Finally, is this an important enough issue uh, for us 
to start the, the charge in our industry to elevate workforce and, uh, as a, a national issue, just as we've done for equine welfare, rehoming, retraining, and medication. I, I submit that I think it is, but I think we need to make the case for that today. So, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, our first speaker will be Oscar. Uh, Oscar, thank you very much for flying out here, first of all, from California. Um, uh, Oscar is not only uh, an event, a, a, a very important uh, member of the California horse racing um, you know, uh, circuit, but he's also a former uh, backstretch worker. He groomed horses and all that, so he, he comes from you know, knowing the, the issues. Oscar, um, starting things off, um, please give us a little bit of the perspective from California and also your, your, your interactions with the Biden administration on uh, uh, access to guest worker visas and, and, and all that. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Okay, good morning. I believe 
really strongly one that there is, has to be, and this is, I think, the strength of this panel here, is that we're going to have an immigration perspective, but we're also going to have an important perspective of what we do to recruit, train, and retain domestic workers, which I believe has to happen as well. So I'm excited to be on this panel. Looking forward to any more questions that will come up. Thank you. Thank you, Oscar. Thank you.
kind of been able to navigate our way through uh, a very difficult system. And um, I got the, the little uh, emoji saying that that's our secret because uh, if any of the other industries knew that we were able to navigate our way through this system, they would be up in arms and, and hopefully they wouldn't say too much, but they could. And so um, what my essential message is, is that if you look at where the Visa program is, if you look at a pyramid, the, the foundation is Broom Elite, the foundation is training the American workers first, the, the next foundation is the benevolence programs, and then finally the very smallest portion of that is the, is the international workers component. Um, but it's of course a vital, vital need right now, and so um, my report is that we're, we're in a good position. Thank you, Will. Appreciate it. Um, next up will be uh, Julio Rubio, who's going to talk a little bit about uh, what all this means, but on a one-on-one -on -one basis. What is it that he runs into on the back stretch most commonly um, uh, when it comes to employee satisfaction about their, their, their pay, their housing, uh, things like that? Julio, what, what is the most common thing you'll hear, and it doesn't have to be just from uh, guest worker visa uh, employees, but other employees, when you work around the back stretch, what, what are the three most common concerns that you hear from, from, from workers as far as the, the, the key things that, that will scare them away to go down to work at Amazon or somewhere else that you cannot work for us? A day off. I'm sorry? A day off to have one. A day off to work most of the you know, seven days a week. Um, that's the probably the complaint I get the most. Um, as far as uh, Hey, I mean, right now, uh, I don't hear very many complaints from the workers. They're, they're fine, especially with all our NPPAs. You know, they get become a medical and dentist, and there's always the champions are on the track, and I mean, they're comfortable. They're the, the slogans, you know, they have for their work, and uh, we, I mean, Will and I have been in, we've been in Louisiana and Florida in the last month, and everybody seems to be. Right now, uh, oh, oh, there's no, no complaints. Um, maybe pay, uh, but I know that uh, the trainers are, rest, uh, are raising their workforce pay. I guess inflation and stuff. So everybody's pretty comfortable right now, as far as. Um, so I, I think that one of my observations from, from the, the education training side. Uh, we often get a lot of, first of all, I'll say this, 98% um, of our students at, at Bluegrass Community Technical College and Equine Studies Program are, are young ladies. And I would venture to say it's the same number at the British Racing School in England, same number at the Racing School in France. And what I would say to employers that, you know, our hiring our, 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 our graduates who are hard working, skilled and all that, is that, you know, you can't have the workforce you wish you had. You have the workforce you have, and you have to adapt. You can't make the workforce change for you. We live in a new era now, so when I get a, a young gal comes to our program for either a one year certificate or a two year associate degree, and, and we place them with some top stables at Key Women, typically the first year or two, they love working in, in the, uh, moving from track to track, the excitement of being on the racetrack and the big day of racing and all that. And after a year or so, that kind of gets old for them and they want to find a farm job <clears throat> so they can get enough farm to have a, a normal life and things like that. <clears throat> and, and so a lot of times I pass this on to employers and, and go, well, that's not, you know what, I, I, I won't accept that. I said, I'm not telling you what to accept or what not to accept. I'm telling you the reality is that you need to shift your way of doing business with, uh, to comply with the workforce that's available to you because you know we're not back in the 1980s anymore or the 1970s uh, because if a young gal graduates from our program and you know, she'll say, I don't want to work for Amazon. 
they, they're offering me more money, they're offering me retirement, they're offering me insurance, but I love horses. I want to work with horses, so meet me halfway. I don't need all the package, but pay, pay me enough so that, that that's not a temptation for me to go work over there. That's all they're saying. They say, give me a day off a week, and I'll figure out another work worker, and we'll switch off uh, our horses that day, or give me a day and a half off to where I can go do my laundry, and just get away from the pressure of work every day. And the, the trainers, the owners, the farm managers, and farm owners that get that and understand that and are willing to work on a schedule a lot are the ones who are retaining their workers longer and are successful because they, they have workers that you know, know their system, know their fee program and all that. The ones that refuse to change are the ones that have a lot of turnover and things aren't going well. That, that's been my um, experience. I know, Julia, if you, you see the same thing when you walk around the back stretch, but there are those who get it and there's those who don't. Right. Okay, so now um, let's move on to uh, Reed, a uh, longtime friend of the uh, National HBPA, longtime friend of mine, and Reed's going to talk about uh, uh, workforce training and, uh, and retainment and also some really uh, strong and good advice for, for employers. Reed? But 
if we train them and skill them, are we actually going to pay them more? How many of you, want to ask this question, how many of you have an employment contract with your employees? Uh, didn't think so. We'll talk about that again here in just a minute. All right, the Department of Labor, should we care about what they do? Well, in recent actions, the trainer was fined $1.6 million, a Hall of Fame trainer that has been sued three times by the Department of Labor since 2012, over a million dollars in fines, three top New York trainers, fined over $150,000, a hunter jumper stable in California, a training stable down in Ocala, and even a little smash burger up in New York. And this is where I learned something, that I would have been in violation if I sent rooms to New York because the rules of the law in New York, Iowa, and California is if you have hourly workers, they have to be paid weekly. I paid bi-weekly. And if they go to California and they work for a week in California, they, they're supposed to be paid weekly. I mean, that's just some of the things that we don't understand about some of the different rules and things. But when these guys come in and start looking at our books and our and looking at the law, it is the law. And when the things that they have required that these trainers do are things that you see on this screen right here, such things as keeping an electronic time where we actually can measure when our groups check in and when they check out. You can go back and read all these rules. This is all public information. It's what was handed down and what the trainers agreed to as it is. The work week is 168 hours, any consecutive 168 hours, seven consecutive days, that's a work week. You can start and end it on any day, and you must designate it in your employment contract, and you can't average the work week. If we look at the number of hours worked, it's, pay attention to this, it's all the time the employees must be on duty or on the premises or at a prescribed workplace from the first thing that we do in the morning until the last thing we do at night. So if you have grooms that are out there at the barn waiting on the trailer to come and they're sitting on their phone and they're doing email and they're playing games and they're doing this, but they sit out there for two or three hours waiting on the van to get there so they can load it up, they are considered by the rule to be on the clock. And so those are things that have happened when these interviews have taken place with some of the hot walkers and the groups who were not complaining. It's just they were just telling the facts of what they do, and this is what wound up being counted as the way that they interpreted it. It's not that we didn't correctly pay the employees, it's that we stole their wages. They call it wage theft. And so it just continues to make it look like that. Overtime is all hours over 40 in a work week, and that's regardless of the pay periods. Again, this was something that I didn't understand. Uh, it must be one and a half times pay, we all understand that. It can't be weighed by agreement. You can't have a group say, okay, well, I'll work 60 hours this week, but if you just let me work 30 hours next week, we'll just call it even, and stuff like that. The Department of Labor doesn't, doesn't look at that way. That group explains that he was on the clock for 60 hours, and they look at the time sheet, or the pay sheet, and he only got paid for 40 hours, that's a violation. Even though over the course of the whole two weeks, he didn't work but 80 hours. If he worked 60 in one week, one seven day period, uh, that counts as the work week, then that's gonna be a violation of that. And it cannot be met through comp time. This is another thing that some of my groups are willing to do. They say, well, just give me a day off and I'll work an extra eight hours this week or whatever it is. But that's not what the Department of Labor allows. Some agriculture employees are actually exempt. So guys working on farms in Kentucky and stuff like that, they are exempt. But if they go to the racetrack and work for eight hours at the racetrack, and those eight hours put them at 48 hours for the week, they can be charged eight hours, you can, the Department of Labor can look at that as eight hours of overtime. Because the work that's done at the track is not considered exempt, even though they may be an exempt agriculture employee. And then in Kentucky, Regardless of the total number of hours worked, the hours worked on the seventh day, if you have a groom or a hot walker or anybody that is a, a non-exempt employee, somebody who is, is an hourly worker, and they work seven days. So we've got a hot walker that comes in that works four hours uh, every day, every morning for seven days in a row. Then that 28, that 28 hours, the, he 
he's going to, he only worked 28 hours a week, but for four of those hours, he's going to get paid time and a half. What about our, we don't have a slide, so I'm the only one who can see the slides. It's a good one. Did I do something? You did read, you, you, you did something. Um, yeah. Yeah, we're, we're going to get the slide back up here. Uh, All right. Well, I can. I, this this was something that was that was really interesting because one of the things that if you look at it from the standpoint of the seventh day, if you were have a work week, what I did was is I scheduled my work week to go from Tuesday through Monday. So Monday was my seventh day. A lot of the track stand using race park, for example, where I was training, they were dark on Monday. So our our dark day, our seventh day, was a day when there was there was a light workload instead of it being the traditional Sunday to Saturday or, you know, Saturday's a heavy work day. If you start your work week on Sunday and end it on Saturday, uh, then you have, can have a, a long seventh day of work. And if these groups are working full time, then you might be winding up with some, some overtime. Okay. Uh, the record keeping part of it, and I don't know if it's like, okay, there we go. Where are we? Are which are required. I think that up there is a, it's one slide ahead of where I am, so I'll have to do it. Uh, employee handbook, is that required? Uh, or an employment contract, is that required? No. The requirements are the ones that you see on the screen right there. The I-9 is required, the W-4 is required, a time sheet is required, and the pay stubs are required. All right? Now, the I-9 is a lot of time we'll can deal with these and talk to you about that, but these have to be filled out by the employee before the end of their first day of working for pay. That part of it is filled out by them, and the bottom part, if somebody helps them, is filled out by that one. Then you have to, yourself, do the part that's your required part by the end of the third day after that first day of working for pay. And these things have to be kept for three years or one year after the person leaves your employment if he's worked for a period of two or three years. And one of the things that has happened in our particular situation here is a trainer, a very prominent trainer, who had $775 fines for each of 99 violations for not having his I-9s uh, appropriately presented to the Department of Labor. Even though when they did all of their, when it was done, he had no undocumented workers, he had no violations of any kind, and none of his employees were complaining. And yet they came in and asked for, you have three days to produce those I-9s or they, you get fined. And that's just the kinds of things that by keeping up with records and stuff like that, that we had. Um, even though that got reduced, about in half, there were still four years of legal expenses that went along with that as we do that. The W-4 has to be turned, it has to be a piece of paper that you have to have, and you have to keep it for four years. And you can't help the employee fill it out. So what can you do in a case like that? Well, you can send them up to the HBPA office because they can't help them fill it out. The, other kinds of things that we have as far as time sheets are concerned, time box or your assistance verified time. This is called, this you see up there now is home base. This is a scheduling making software that's online. You can go to homebase.com, I believe it's maybe homebase.org, one of the two. Anyway, and it's a very good uh, time sheet type of thing. This is a schedule, this is the scheduling function. It also has where the Groups can be told how they're going to punch in. They can actually punch in on their time clock. Uh, with that, uh, when I when I publish this, I get a text to my cell phone that shows me the schedule. Any of my employees get a schedule. They get a text that tells them when they're supposed to be working. So far, like afternoon feeding and stuff, if we have any kind of special times uh, that they're doing, we can actually put that online. One of the other things that. Uh, well, when I ask you if you have a, an employment contract, let me ask that question again. How many of you have an employment contract in place? Okay, let me ask you this question. Raise your hands if you have employees. How y'all do your own work? 
Okay, good. Because if you have employees, you have an employment contract. Because if you ask somebody to, you tell them, hey, why don't you come walk, walk some hots for me and I'll pay you $10 a head for each hot that you walk, and they say, yeah, sure, I'll do that. You just created an employment contract. Because even though it does not require to be in writing, it is a contract if it's done verbally. Do you have an employee handbook? Again, this was something that was it's done online. There's a lot of legal mumbo jumbo in there that's part of the Louisiana law and stuff like that. But what it does allow us to do is, is to go in there and put some individual things like I have a um, in there, it, it talks about the clothing they wear and the presentation they make to the public and things like that. These are all things that are available to us online and stuff like that. So in the employment contract that I use, I have a detailed employment responsibility page where it explains what it is that, they're from, that I expect them to do. And down at the bottom, we can write stuff in and, and get that done and have those signed and it, one of the important parts of it this day and time is how do you want to be contacted? We have cell phone numbers, we have text, we have email. How do you want to do it? So what can you do? There are online employment tools. Work with the HBPA or your horseman's representatives because that's one of the things that we own in that employment contract. It says, do you provide benefits? You can say yes. We provide benefits. We provide health benefits. We provide uh, education benefits. We do have benefits. And I think part of what we've seen here at this convention is some of the many benefits that we do have. It's called the Benefit Providers Panel. And so we can offer, we can say we have a, a job that has benefits. And then uh, we can hire a human resources pro. Or you can have a daughter as a professional accountant and she can handle that for you. Uh, whatever works, but you can do that. Those things are available to us the main thing is, is to be responsible. So what's the take home message? Self-evaluate your stable. What are your job requirements? Are they listed? Do your grooms know what they're expected to do? Your exercise rider, your hot walkers, and whatever that is? And how about your records? Are they filed? Do you actually keep track of the hours that your people are working? What do you do as far as correcting or disciplining? And what about education and job training? Do you provide opportunities for them to take group and eat classes or go get English as a second language or maybe even offer to help them pay some of the tuition to go to the community college or something and get some additional training that can help them improve their job, pay and benefits. And the question to ask is when you get done, would I work for me? That's one of the big questions. Make a labor plan. Look at the budget. And one of the biggest things it says, well, just like we heard yesterday, all, all trainers are broke. All trainers can't keep paying for everything. All trainers are cranky and, and tired and stuff like that. Well, let's sit down and look at a budget and see how we can afford to do the things that we need to do to be competitive in the marketplace, as Brenda was talking about earlier. Take advantage of what organizations like the HBPA offer. Because we do have access to bringing in uh, accountants, bringing in human resources people. We have one of the best group down here as far as working with our international labor relations and stuff like that. Uh, we provide a lot of service, and so we can uh, get that help. If you train your team, they will help you train your horses. And the overriding thing is be a responsible trainer. That's what our, our message is and stuff like that. And so, you know, as we ask the question, what are we so angry about? Let's ask the question is, well, what can I do? What, what am I so angry about? And when you analyze what we're angry about, then let's figure out what it is we can do about it rather than just sit around and you know, be the old man sitting out in the driveway and hollering at the, at the sun because it's too bright today. All right, a lot to digest. Reed, thank you very much. Um, and I believe you have some materials also available for folks to uh, read and look at. So let, let's now take a, a quick breather and step back. Uh, we've covered a lot, you know, so far here and now. Um, but my question now is going to be this, and this is going to be the, the, to, to the whole panel, but Oscar, I'll start with you. Um, you know, we're not making any of this up. 
Did, you know, like I said, you know, I, I grew up in the horse business. I remember back in the 70s and 80s, it wasn't this complicated. You know, you went to the back stretch, you got, you signed your W-2, you went to work. Times were different. Now, we have to deal with a lot of these details. As business people, as horsemen, we're no different than the guy who ran the landscaping business down the road or the construction business down the road or Amazon. So either we compete and compete successfully for the workforce or we don't. It's not a gray area, it's either one or the other. Um, and if I'm producing some good worker, as I, as I said to you from our college, their expectations are gonna be slightly different, like I said before, than my expectations were back in 1975 when I went to work on the back stretch at, at Belmont. Uh, so keeping that in mind, the workforce has changed, the laws have changed. Um, Oscar, if, if we were to uh, elevate our, our industry approach to this problem, so I, I was cite the AWMA, the Agricultural Workforce Management Association, which is based in Lexington, and they deal with exactly the same issues for farmers all around the country but they go to each region and they do sessions just like this in a, in a bowl and they go through all the details with those farm owners, exactly how much they have to pay, keeping a timeline, all these things. Is that something that we should be embracing as well? Uh, above the Vietnam, the efforts we're doing now in Washington, D.C. with lobbying on these, on these uh, things, do we, need to, do we need to up our game on the national level from your perspective from, from a national perspective, what, what would be the thing you would recommend us as an industry to do uh, to address a lot of these issues? Well, first, I want to just commend Reed for just an amazing presentation about what the responsibilities are of both employers and workers. I, I think as I'm listening to, you know, me being kind of the government guy in the room here, you know, you know, you know, working in the Department of Agriculture and really the regulations and the expectations, um, the fundamental question is. Is it, is it worth it? And, and I got to tell you, from where I sit on the California Horse Racing Board and the information that I get about the economic indicators of where the industry is at, I believe that we finally have hit a, a point of stability. I, I, I think that with the willingness of a horseman to, to understand that it's important to change, to understand that we're an, an industry that needs to evolve, uh, more importantly, I think horsemen are wanting to lead their barns, their operation better than when they got it. I think that I think that there is hope for our industry. So absolutely, it is very much worth understanding the competitive advantage when it comes to really dealing with labor issues. Um, you know, I got a chance to meet Julio and Will um, about maybe about seven or eight years ago, and it was a meeting that I was asked to pull together because the horsemen were being denied. Of and I remember being there at the USCIS, that's that important immigration arm that gives thumbs up or thumbs down to applications. And I remember on our end, uh, we're, we're about five or six horsemen, and then on their end, we're probably about 10 or 12 people. We had one opportunity to make the case. And really, me, just my years and years of working on the backstretch, understanding the buzzwords, understanding where the hurdles were, and helping them to understand that horse racing doesn't fit into any one box. And that it is so incumbent upon each of us to make sure that we are telling our story, especially the policymakers. Never let an opportunity go by to have your voice heard because we have to help people to understand the unique nature of what we do. You know, there's farms and there's racetracks. And then on every racetrack, you've got the little guys, uh, the, the, the small time trainer, who I believe are still the backbone of the industry. And we need to bring many of them back. We also have to compare their needs and expectations to those bigger operations that have no problem with hiring bookkeepers and lawyers and everything else. But what I found, uh, it, what occurred to me after that meeting, and I think it was a successful outcome by all accounts, in fact, I think uh, we ended up getting things to will the leadership on the h 2 at the end is, what well, we need are more people in this room to be at those tables. That you are the ones that are creating jobs. You're the ones that are bringing uh, uh, economic opportunities for, um, for veterinarians and for people who sell feed and those who are dealing with tack and the list goes on and on with the multiplier effect that I believe the horse racing industry has. So in answer to your question, um, I, 
I believe that we have our work cut out. I really do. Um, I also believe that it's worth it. It's worth making sure that we continue to tell our story as horsemen, as people who really, really understand that the sports world is changing and that we uh, have done more than our share to embrace change and to be uh, a sport that's evolving towards that. Thank you very much. Well said. Yes. Um, Will, same question to you, and let me preface it also by saying that um, what Reed just did is very important. It's, it's, a, a, it's, a, it's a down to earth, grassroots type of set of pointers and advice and best practices that a lot of our, our colleagues could use on a day to day basis. Um, and to Oscar and to Will, is there money in the government, uh, I mean, grants and things like that for workforce training and development where we, we could take somebody like Reed and fly him to every jurisdiction and bring horsemen into a room and say, you know, here's how you can structure your, your operation and all that so it's in compliance. Is that something that we can do as an industry to maybe get funding to create a moving, you know, office on workforce guidance and best practices, or is that just a, you know, a dream? Well, you know, just so, you know, we have to get really creative, and where programs don't exist, we have to make sure that we are doing our best to communicate once again the need of our uh, You know, earlier when we were prepping for this, we were talking about where I see a trend starting to happen. It's about people who need a second chance. Uh, they, some refer to them as ex balance. Well, most jurisdictions, they have that box on every uh, license application that's ever been convicted of a felony. Well, that's enough to disqualify somebody. But I believe that if you're, you're talking about where our best investment can be made, yes, we absolutely have to keep an eye on the immigration side. H2B, we look at the happening in H2A workers, 100%. But I also believe that we have to embrace the domestic worker component. And that's why I really admire what you both are doing, because we have uh, an amazing sport with an amazing opportunity for somebody to, 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 to have a second chance. And if we can tap into uh, grant programs, because we now know that there are institutions that now have been trying programs with a form of rehabilitation, where it makes when they come out, they're able to, to kind of parlay those skills to a, to a racetrack or a farm, but if they're gonna be excluded because of some old law, uh, maybe they, they, they you know, again, you, you know, I think there's variations of the type of felony, but for those that are prepared and able, I believe we have to absolutely um, tap into those. And there will be grant programs out there. I also believe um, uh, understanding the community college system as a tremendous partner of ours. You know, they are always looking for opportunities to bring in more grant dollars. So we gotta go beyond just, I believe, talking to one another, but rather going out and talking to those that are within our community try to build these partnerships because any grant program anymore that I see up in the Department of Agriculture, it's, excuse me, it's all about partnerships. Everybody's willing to tell a great story, but to make a government dollar stretch is what they want to see. We typically do that by involving the local chamber of commerce, by involving a couple of horse meat groups, by involving, uh, you know, health clinic, uh, immigration service providers, and the local community college that we do yeah, I think there's a lot of room, and I believe, once again, why the HBPA is so critical. I mean, you have a, an organization that is like none, no other. In fact, I, I wish we had an HBPA back in California most days um, because of what you do and how creative you can be, and more importantly, the voice of people like right? over Will and William, same question. Yeah, if I'm going to build a, a better mousetrap, how would you do it? Well, and I'm going I'm to follow on what Oscar said about how important the HBPA is what we do, but uh, whenever I go to Kentucky, I always love to go and sit and talk with Marty because his insights on all aspects of the racing industry are just so fascinating. But one of the insights that Marty gave me that I always take with me is that, uh, you know, the HBPA serves the interests of the horsemen in so many different ways, but a lot of them aren't readily uh, visible. You know, the, the medication and the wager and all these things that the HBPA does for the horsemen the horsemen don't always see. So sometimes I say, you know, what am I paying? What am I paying into? Why am I a part of the HPPA? What, what Marty said is that the work that we do with immigration is a tangible benefit that the, the horsemen can see that, oh, they're, they're on our track. They're, they're answering questions of the horsemen, of the, of the workers, and, uh, you know, they're giving these free legal clinics. 
And this is something that the HPPA can say, this is one of the things that we provide to our members is that we are helping your workers you know, have security, have the ability to at least hope to get some kind of legal status if they don't afford to have a workforce that is compliant. And you know, in the past month, we've been to uh, given clinics at Delta Downs, Fairgrounds, Tampa, Ocala, Gulfstream, and Floral. And those are all, uh, thank you Marty for letting Julio go out to all those different places because uh, if, you, if you ever want to see something impressive, walk the backside of the track with Julio. He knows every single worker in every single track in the United States. They all, they all love him. He's, it's, uh, and it's because he, they know that he, he cares about them and, and, their, and their, you know, their, well, their well-being. But um, it's a tangible benefit that uh, the HPP does provide is, the, is to help the workers at least have some kind of idea of what their rights are. Well, you anything to add? Now that you know all the workers across America? <laughs> Um, well, one of the things that they're um, comfortable with, because Will and I have been doing this for, what, 10 years more, um, they always want to see a familiar face, somebody that they're, you know, they can trust, and they, I guess, can build that trust throughout the years. So, um, yeah, no, I mean, um, one of the things we've been doing the last three years is uh, a lot of uh, workers that um, we've been helping with visas for years, like Dallas and guys, they finally got their uh, green cards. We've been switching uh, workers, that, and, and most of the trainers, these are the, their loyal workers that have been, you know, working for them for years, and uh, and now they, they got that American dream where, you know, they they don't have to go back to the consulate and get a visa. They're permanent residents now. So we've been helping a lot of a lot of um, um, workers like that across the country for. I think I think an important thing to keep in mind, and my experience in working with preparing students for jobs in, in the racing industry and breeding industry, um, oftentimes I'll talk to a trainer and they'll say, well, you know, their their expectations, they be, you know, our graduates from our program for this work-life balance, and they say that kind of snicker a little bit, uh, is is. You know, it's crazy, and I and I agree. I said the work-life balance expectations of somebody who walked walk a thousand miles from Honduras to work on a racetrack in America to make enough money to send home is completely different than the work-life balance expectations of a young gal from BCGZ equine who's got a, a two years uh, equine studies degree. However, that being the case. You still are paying them a fair living wage, right? Whether they walk a thousand miles from Honduras or they walk, or they, they took an Uber from the campus at BCDC, that doesn't change the fact that they, they we need to kind of make, make a more uniform uh, industry for workers. So if we're not poaching workers from one another and not, uh, you know, you know, you know, wringing our hands about, you know. Is, is this person going to stick with my barn through next week, or uh, am I, I going to be able to keep this worker? Uh, we, we have to raise our game because everybody around us has already done that. After COVID, things have changed. Workers today, including many guest worker visa workers, uh, have different expectations. They can now go down the road and find another job. So. You know, that's that's a key takeaway I think today is that uh, we have a great industry. I mean, a lot of the kids who come to our school live, breathe, and would die of working horses. In fact, I was at the Cuban Sales a, a year ago, and a gentleman, I'm not going to say his name, but a pretty well-to-do guy, bought a horse that's going to be his dream horse. He wants to win the Derby with this horse in a couple of years. And as we were walking out. Um, we got the discussion about who's going to be taking care of this horse, the workforce, and all that. I said, you realize that after you drop that last bid on this horse, which was upwards of six figures, um, and they were bidding in fifty thousand dollar increments, I told this gentleman, I said, if you did one more bid on this horse for fifty thousand dollars, you can hire one of the gals in my program for a year, and she will sleep in the stall with that horse for the next three years make sure that 
you know, that, that horse is going to go to the Kentucky Derby, you know, unless he's not fast enough. And he sat there and he goes, you know, I've never really thought about it that way. I said, well, you just made a huge investment, and if you'd have gone one more step, you would have guaranteed having a, a valet in that spell with that horse for the next three years. And, and, and so when, once he, he started doing it, and I said, you're a businessman, you know, that was just another incremental invest, investment. And, and so that, those kind of conversations, you know, uh, are important to have to say, if you want to succeed with that horse or with that operation, you've got to invest in your workforce and that will pay dividends. I think we all know that. So uh, that was a little bit of an aside. Let's open it now for, I think we have uh, another couple of minutes. Questions, uh, comments, questions. Um, you know, this is an important subject. I know everybody's waiting to get to the races, uh, but um, I'm going to open it up for a couple of questions. And uh, yes. Hi, I'm Ann Claudia with the Minnesota HBPA. And just to take on to what Reed was saying, by day, I am an HR professional. So I, all of that is in my wheelhouse. I know how important I9s are, W4s, and all of that. And I think one thing that I've appreciated being on the, our board is what we bring from the outside. We're not just the love of horses, we're also accountants, lawyers, HR professionals. And I am very happy to um, help out answer questions because me being in the corporate field, whether it's the corporate or the farm, we all have to follow the same laws and the same procedures. So um, being that, you know, I'm, like I said, I'm very glad to help out and bring my knowledge from that aspect too. So thank you, Reed, that was really good. And you never want to see whether you're a, a corporation or a trainer, you don't want to see your name in the headlines. Um, I think we get enough negative publicity. So, um, thank you. Very well said. Yes. Well, first observation, I'm glad my husband isn't training anymore because I was his bookkeeper and that hurt my head looking at everything traders have to do to keep track of their um, health if you're going to do it the right way. Uh, my question is, is there an opportunity for horse racing out of the terrible situation of nat natural disasters such as the tornadoes in Western Kentucky? There's a whole segment population down there, people that lost their jobs, they lost their house, they read where they live, they lost their cars, and so they have nothing. A lot of them came from Puerto Rico to work in the chicken factories or the candle factories. Those are gone now. Is there, and this is something I've talked about with Marty, some uh, Jake McLean used to be in the horse racing business. Um, his wife is from one of the really hard hit areas, and they're going down there trying to pick, you know, match people with jobs, but the thing is, you can't just put anybody in a racing stable, but is, is there a way for racing to try to get some of those people? Uh, and especially the fact that, especially if they're not you know, married, they, if they want to live in a tax room, they would maybe even have housing and wouldn't need a car, but is there an opportunity, again, to take advantage of the domestic workforce uh, with these people that have nothing? Well, I mean, let me start off. Because it's Kentucky, um, what, one of the challenges that we have, for example, in our, in our own backyard is communication. Uh, so we have a three-year community college program. There are high school level equine programs. We've got programs all over Kentucky to teach people about working with horses. The, the problem we often have is the information trickling out in those areas that there are those opportunities. I can tell you right now that in every state that, that we are represented here, you have horse councils in each of those states. And I remember a couple of years ago with Don Osteller, we got together with the head of the Pennsylvania Horse Council, who had a long string of kids in 4-H, uh, AQHA youth programs and all that, looking for work with horses. And I told him, do you know that there's a Pennsylvania HB Bureau looking for workers and all that? And that connection had really not happened so there's a lot we can do now in each of our states to link uh, willing domestic workers with jobs and, and we can provide the training that you know. We need pretty easy. Well, that's one of the things that we offer in the Grooming E program is the basic Grooming 99. It's a three-day class where we can get somebody where they can actually work with a horse that's never worked with a horse before. Uh, 
um, and if they, we can recycle them through it. And those are the kinds of things that I think what you're talking about is we have a group of people that are suddenly displaced and in order to retrain them, they need a specific skill, not so much the background. We can then come back and teach them the, the anatomy and the physiology and the things that we teach them once they know how to do the job. But we, we've got a unique job in which a person can't just walk in off the street and start doing it. And, and that's something that we do offer. And if we can put it together, I've got instructors around, don't have as many now because of the last two years of not doing anything, everybody had to go find their own, you know, jobs too. Uh, but those are programs that we do have available. And we can come into that area in Kentucky and train a group of people if they want to do it. I'm going up to Virginia, one Colonial Downs, Frank, and the Virginia HPKA have been a supporter of Green Relief since it first started moving outside of Texas in 2002 and three. And, uh, we're going to do a basic group 99 there the first week of July when they are getting ready to open their meet. And we have one of our graduates there who's on the board, uh, HPPA board now, and she's going to be heading up. She's also got connections in the public school system. So we're expecting a meet group there. And we'll have workers ready for trainers that are coming into the barn area there that if they want to hire them, they'll be ready there. And we can do the same thing in a place like what you're talking about where people been suddenly displaced. We're doing a similar thing down, I'm working with a team down in St. Croix right now, um, and they're, we're going to open a, a retirement for racehorses at the prison there, do the prison program that we've done here, a prison in the United States right now. And one of the things that they had was all of the destruction from, I don't remember, Ida, Ada, whichever one it was that hit the Virgin Islands, the same one that one of the ones that wiped out Puerto Rico. And, and they don't have an industry. They have horses running in the streets down there. And part of what the governor who's putting the money up to do some of this said, first thing we have to do is provide for the retired horses. And the second thing we do is have to retrain the workforce before he would put money into actually reestablishing the racing park. And so that's what we're we're doing there. We can do that even. I think uh, that's, that's going to have to be the last word because we're, I think we're on time, we're close to it. Yeah. I can sense Eric behind me looming. Uh, so, uh, but let me tell you something that, you know, if we're going to solve or, or, or work for solving this important issue, you've got, you've got the A team up here. And with the National HPPA and all of your affiliates and all that, you, you know, uh, utilize this, this incredible team of, of uh, expertise and uh, people who can solve this problem with you. Uh, so let's give a round of applause for our <laughs>